Okay. Uh, next, we're going to move. Um, we are going today till 11 committee. Um, I don't see anyone from DPS here yet. Um, I get my guess is they're going to show up right at 10. Um, uh, Dan, uh, we've asked you to give us an update on uh, the chart of accounts uh, system at the Agency of Education. Um, and so uh, you did provide a summary for us. Um, maybe you could just walk us through, um, walk us through that. See if there are questions. Um, once again, Dan Smith, the IT consultant for the Legislative Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, I'm not going to go through you know, all the text in the document I submitted. Um, that, that's available. You can certainly read it later if you haven't read it already. I'll, I'll just do a short summary, and I'd like to leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, I've got uh, Tim Holland from the Agency of Digital Services is also in attendance. He's the project manager for the system. Great. He did have uh, detailed questions. He's really the one that can do this. Uh, just a quick summary of how we ended up here. Um, the shared school district data management system is a common financial system that's being rolled out to all the supervisory unions, supervisory districts. This is an effort that's gone back uh, to approximately 2015 when the legislature said, we want all the school, school districts on one financial system so we can really compare apples and oranges, get a picture, big picture view of things. Uh, over the years, there's been uh, several changes by legislation to the required end date. Right now, it's July 1st of 2022. The system has been rolled out um, in, in a phased approach. And, and again, I'm gonna kind of compare this to uh, Judiciary's Odyssey system that you were briefed on, I believe, in your last meeting. The, the advantage of doing these phased approaches is you learn from your mistakes each time, as opposed to giving it to everybody and then just hoping that the thing works and if it doesn't, you got real trouble. In the phased approach, you do a, a group of uh, common users, get them installed, you look at how that went, you address user complaints. The next phase, the next rollout, you try to do better. And then over time, everybody's done, and ideally, everybody's done. At this point, through the deployment, uh, they're approximately one third of the way through all the supervisory unions and districts. I believe the number is uh, 19 or 54 so far. The legislative deadline for completing the rollout is July 1st of 2022. So they've got about 18 months left to do the remainder of the system. In uh, November, the Kingdom East School District, which is due to be one of the next groups getting rolled out, submitted a, a letter to uh, Secretary French of the Agency of Education, CC to a number of the legislators, and requested that their rollout be delayed uh, because of problems that they'd heard of from, uh, I think it was Addison that had the rollout and it was accounting questions, et cetera, et cetera. I've been discussing this uh, for the past week or so with uh, AOE and ADS uh, at the request of the Joint Fiscal Office, try to get up to speed on what's going on. To summarize where we stand, it's like AOE and ADS recognize that there may be some problems. Uh, there are things that need to be sorted out, the request for enhancements, et cetera. The constraint we have is that there is a hard deadline to this by legislative mandate, this has to be done by 2022. And while it's easy enough to say, yes, we can defer Kingdom East, you know, push them farther back, you can end up with a situation where you push everybody to the back of the bus. And at that point, you've got too many installations to do in too short a time, and you could end up in a worse situation. So, uh, my recommendation is that at this point is let AOE and ADS continue to manage the situation, look at what's best for them for the rollout, you know, consider the Kingdom East uh, concerns. If they need to be pushed back, push back, but be cautious about it because there are uh, potential troubles for that. 
Um, if AOE and ADS feel that there just won't be enough time left to do this right, uh, I would request that the legislature and this committee be open to the idea of pushing back the deadline one more time if needed. I, I think everybody's objective is to do this rollout and installation as smoothly as possible, keep as many people as happy as possible, but there are constraints there. And I'll stop there and ask if there's any questions. So uh, I have a question. So having spoken with um, one of my two supervisory unions um, that has gone through this, uh, they, uh, they describe the process as excruciating. So um, one of, I, I guess my question is maybe for Tim, um, but maybe for you, Dan, it's more around personnel. Um, and assistance that's available for supervisor unions as they are um, working through this process. Is that and something I, that you're I able really to talk to, about? Uh, the one point I do want to make is similar to the judiciary system, we're experiencing a phased rollout of a very complex system to people that already had existing systems that may be better or worse than what is being provided. And then on top of that, we had the COVID-19 pandemic, which has really thrown a monkey wrench in the resource availability, both in the SUSD side and on the state side. It really has made things difficult for everybody. Uh, that said, I'd like to ask uh, Tim to jump in if he's available. Good morning, this is Tim Holland, project manager, the Agency of Digital Services. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. And I think maybe to uh, add to what Dan has shared and uh, target a little bit of the question about personnel and, and the assistance that folks are getting, uh, as Dan has just alluded to, you know, the challenges of the teams that the districts have assigned um, with uh, you know doing day-to-day -day work as well as uh, addressing um, things they need to do to manage COVID uh, challenges. Uh, they are continuing to work on the project. Uh, I don't know how much of a distraction that is for each of the members, but in terms of what our project team is bringing to the table about a year ago uh, in October of 19, we processed an amendment to this contract and added uh, $1.2 million for additional training and support services and have provided the uh, every district going through this process with an, uh, a, a very generous and nobody has yet hit that threshold where they have asked for too much, but a generous amount of self directed, um, requested help from the consultants. So as soon as they find they need help, they're struggling in any area, they want guidance, they want uh, more help with um, filling out their, their documentation, configuring the system, better understanding uh, what they're seeing in the videos, et cetera. It is, it is available to them. They schedule it. They get it, it, it's scheduled at their convenience. And so I, I just want to say, I think that um, in addition to our own team from the AOE and myself also following up and tracking with them, they have, um, they have a lot of this support there in place. And so uh, I'm going to ask one more question um, and uh, happy to have both you and Dan answer it. So, uh, and I think Dan has already answered it probably twice, but let's see, um, you know, in terms of the angst uh, and uh, anxiety that we're getting out of the districts for implementing this, um, you know, any, any, um, anything that you think we should um, think about in terms of trying to understand why, why that is, you know, I'm hearing Dan say this is just difficult and it's a staged process and it's, you know, shifting systems, but is there anything else that you think that we should understand about why we're hearing from supervisory unions? 
Uh, I'll try and hit on three points. Um, change and uh, reporting and um, there's another, it'll come back to me. So we've got um, people that are working and very familiar with working in a variety of systems that they're comfortable with. And some of them are very feature rich, um, costly systems. And <clears throat> it's a transition of going from what you're used to doing in a system to having to learn to do something different. And it may not be as convenient and in some areas, some features and functions may be more convenient. Hello. But the change, I'm sorry, did somebody have a question? No. Oh. So um, that has been one of those areas where people have come to the new system, they don't see something they feel is important for them and have asked for that to be enhanced. We have established a governance and change advisory board with the districts, uh, both members of the finance business manager uh, group and the HR professionals group. And they help to advise the AOE in terms of prioritizing these or dismissing any that as a group, um, maybe they uh, help that district understand ways that those that have already gone in are able to, to do what it is that the individuals brought up. So that has been going okay. I'd, I'd say um, that the uh, list of enhancements, those ones that we have worked with the governance group to identify as agreed upon must have showstoppers. Um, one of the, the things I would say is that in the list that Kingdom East provided, there are several that are actually features in the system, but they aren't as um, complete as they're used to. So a bank reconciliation process, for example, that works for the accounts payable checks, but not payroll. So we have an enhancement scheduled to go in for, and it's actually um, scheduled for the upcoming uh, spring uh, prior to the release of, uh, for the next round going live in July of 2020. And there are a couple like that. Another one, interfund transfer or due to due promise referenced as, that's currently in test now. That there is a process, but it's, it's not exactly what the districts are used to. And so we've been asking that that be uh, modified as well. So of those top priority ones, they are in a roadmap to be introduced in the months coming uh, before the, the next round in flight will go live. Um, and then some of the things that we found with reporting, while it's not necessarily um, that all of these are, are um, or, or findings that an auditor may have pointed out. What we're learning as we're trying to do some root cause analysis is that what uh, the, the setups and the, um, the data that's coming in from different districts may be the, the root cause of different results. That maybe, for example, somebody who did not load a beginning balance when they started versus somebody that did and a custom report was built to try and work across multiple districts and based on the structure that the first one or two groups that asked for that report. Um, so it was formulated around that with the, the eye towards working for everybody. But as, um, as another round comes in and new districts try some of these, they're finding that perhaps there's something that they, something didn't work. So we're addressing those on a case by case basis. We're looking at them to either resolve it or to identify that there is a, an outright thing that needs to be adjusted for everybody. And we've only had a couple of those and they are um, on a list that we're working with PowerSchool aggressively right now to work with the districts to make sure we identify any, any areas that potentially don't tie out to their systems um, and, and give them what they need. Our goal, our objective in this is to, is to give them the system they need to do their work. Um, I think that was that was all I would say. It's mainly around change, and that's that's difficult. And uh, as Dan said, you know, other distractions, if you will, and challenges with COVID and 
Um, I think that this, lastly, maybe to say that uh, this is not the kind of work day in and day out that these people do, like uh, uh, a dedicated person or persons that work purely on extracting data, mm -hmm. loading the tools, and, and these being spreadsheets that then can be imported into a new system, setting up tables and areas that um, they're, they're, some have gone through migrations before, others have not. So uh, the learning curve there is, is a little bit more for some than others. And, and we have heard some pluses along the way too. So like you see in many projects, you don't always hear about um, the things that are going great, but you're, you're often you know, hear about the challenges as they come up. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, committee, any questions? Okay, Dan, thank you. Oh, Marty, did you have a question? Well, no, I just wanted to comment. I, I, I certainly understand all of the comments that Dan has made and that Tim has made as well. I, I in my former life, I lived through a gigantic uh, computer change as well. And I know how difficult it is to get people to learn a new system and to do their old work at the same, do their current work at the same time and then learn a new system and figure out how it relates to them and why do we have to do this? And the office didn't have to do that before. I understand all that. I, I just want to make sure that there is a mechanism for the local school district. In, the, in this case, the example was my school district, Kingdom East, that had those concerns that they have someone they can go to to express those concerns and perhaps get some guidance on how they might be able to better utilize the system that's being offered to them, uh, learn from examples of other people, and to have a realistic consideration of does delay really make sense or uh, just figure out how to get additional support from the vendor, as, as Tim mentioned, uh, to help them through this process. I, I understand Dan's concern that you've got, you can't have everybody asking to go to the end of the line and be the last one, that, that doesn't work. And I also understand the legislature's concern about this project has been delayed and delayed and delayed and people don't understand why they can't just get it done. Um, so, so I guess I want to make sure that there's a process that the school district can go back to AOE or back to Tim, as an example, as a project manager to get some concrete steps where they can get some help and to make a reasonable decision about whether parts of it should be delayed or not. Still keeping in mind, the whole project has to get done at some point. So I'm not sure if that's a question. <laughs> and so, uh, great. Tim, I don't know if you had anything else to add um, outside of the, cons Marty, are you looking for something outside of the consultant um, time? No, I don't think so. As long as that time is indeed available and personnel are aware that it's available and AOE still has a guideline of when things need to get done. And then that both the consultant and the school district simply have to work together uh, based on everything else they have to do at the same time in order to get their portion of the project done. I, I just wanna make sure there's open communication on that area. If yep. I could, I'm sorry, I had to step away. I'm, I'm actually facilitating another meeting starting at 10. So I just let them know. I needed another couple of minutes uh, to, to answer your question. Um, uh, the there is there are mechanisms in place. Uh, we have biweekly meetings with each of the rounds, and we talk to them about the process, how it's working, um, the pace, what we can do to give them more help, and um, and get a, a a pulse on the status of how they're doing. And in those meetings, we've also learned and agreed on infusing more time uh, where we have, let's say, uh, a, a room to adjust the schedules 
and the activities, we've done so. Individually, these folks also have a direct line to the AOE. We've given them a, a, an email address that they can send us um, any questions they want directly to us and we feel those. We also have a weekly meeting that we've been having for the better part of a year with leads from the rounds to get their direct input and to vet some ideas with them to um, make adjustments to training, to schedule, to our process. We also meet regularly with the VASBO uh, and the V-SHARP groups, the HR and the finance teams. And we give an update there and we field questions there. And the governance change advisory group that I mentioned before, where we discuss um, uh, issues and things that um, will prioritize the work that, uh, that has been asked to be done in addition to the enhancement. So uh, I, I guess I would lastly say that um, you know, we aren't, uh, our team is not, you know, crossing our arms, beating our chest and saying, you, you're just not going to get any wiggle room out of us uh, in terms of a pause per se versus trying to, as we have been, allow the time needed. So where we need to infuse a couple more weeks to finish an activity or to try and give them a little more time on the back end we still continue to have those discussions on how we can help facilitate their success and for each of these rounds. And some have been um, very successful. I think this is probably one of the ones where we're up against the deadline with uh, a couple more activities more than we did in the past. And I think that is COVID related. And again, I think we're, we're gonna be working with these folks to make sure that we can collaboratively get through this. Tim, thank you very much. Uh, and Dan, thank you for, Senator? Just a, a, a question. I, I, I'm sure you've looked at the Kingdom East School District's letter uh, in which they detail some 11 issues. Uh, the issues that they're talking about, are there any of those issues that represent deficiencies in the fundamental functionality of the system? Or do you believe that all of these things can be addressed by user training? I would say that um, I think it's a blend and mostly, uh, I, I won't even say it's mostly one or the other. Some that we've already gone through this response have identified that it is uh, a misuse of the system and, and what I'll call not um, uh, inappropriate, just training, back to your point. And, the, and there are some that we have identified that are not features, uh, as I mentioned a couple earlier, that are either um, partially or in full uh, available. And we're working to get those in before the next round, the, the current round goes live. And lastly, um, there are a couple that uh, have come up that we are working with the vendor, PowerSchool, to confirm that uh, at the root cause, while it's not the way the system is intended to be used, uh, or um, what could be perceived as training, it still is questionable that a person could be able to do that activity. And that may end up resulting in an enhancement request to shore up any items that could be uh, something that just shouldn't be able to be done. So as an example, really quick, the, the reference about changing the name on a check um, there is a report that shows what names were uh, on every check ever issued. But the vendor table that uh, a check is issued to uh, is pulled from when other reports are, are run. And in pulling those vendor names, if a vendor name has been changed, um, it's going to reflect whatever the current vendor name is. And it's not the process to go back into a list to be able to change a vendor name. And again, you can always see who a check has been made payable to uh, from an auditing perspective. But it's one of those things that we think, even if it was done incorrectly, the fact that it can be done, we want to ask that it be an enhancement so that um, you know it'll always have to be a new, 
a net new vendor, even if you're trying to correct, um, uh, you know, something about that vendor. We have to work through the details of that, but that's an example where it's kind of in between. It's it's a training issue, but it's also something we're taking seriously enough to make sure that it goes away. I hope that helps. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank okay. you for having me. If there's no more, I'm gonna jump over to my other meeting. Thank you very much, Tim and Dan. Thanks for um, your work on this. Uh, we are going to move into uh, reports from the Department of Public Service. Uh, Commissioner Tierney is here with uh, Clay Purvis and Rob Fish. Uh, we have three um, items that uh, we want to get through here. Um, we want to get an update on the current status of the CUDs, which we had hoped to get to at the last meeting. So we'll start with that. Uh, we want to talk about uh, the latest monthly report and the spend the CARES Act spending. Um, and then we want to talk about um, emergency plan and the uh, plan for uh, the uh, creation of the 10 year telecom plan. And we do have both the monthly update and uh, a letter from the commissioner uh, regarding her intentions for the 10 year telecommunications plan update that have been posted to our site. And Mike, I'm seeing you post in chat. If there is another document uh, besides those two, it would be good to let me know. Yes, uh, there are five, whoa. There are five additional documents that I have posted to the web, came in shortly um, thereafter. I just sent the link to review all of them and I've made Clay the co-host so that he can share his screen as he presents okay. them. Okay. Um, great. Uh, so, uh, excellent. Let's start um, then with Commissioner, if you could get us started with the CUD update. Absolutely. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. And um, I think in the interest of time, we'll just go directly to Rob, who is going to give you a combination of what would have been presented the last time and then the more recent developments we have to report. Go ahead, Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, this is the same presentation I was planning to give last week, but I will add additional information. Uh, do I have the power to share my screen or does Clay want to go through the slides? I don't know if I have that power. Robert, I've made you a co-host so that you can, if you know how to, share your screen. Perfect. Well, let me do that and I will figure that out. Hold on a second here. I apologize. Well, first, before I get there, I'll, this is actually an updated map of the CUDs. Uh, the one in the presentation is a month old. Uh, another town has joined Deerfield Valley. Uh, the town of Newfane recently voted. Uh, there's several towns that are in consideration right now of joining the Lamoille CUD and the Northwest CUD. Uh, so there is additional expansion that's going to have. This new version of the map shows in a lighter color associated with the district of uh, what the study area is of other towns that are considering joining. Uh, I've also recently learned in, that I'll, I'll be speaking to the Chittenden Regional Planning Commission that there's some discussion there of whether creating a CUD or joining um, neighboring CUDs, which I, I, that in my opinion, that is the way to go is to join on to some of the neighboring ones. Um, so let me switch back to the presentation. If I, for being a technology person, sometimes Zoom is a bit complicated here. I apologize of switching the screen share. Uh, sorry, wonderful technical uh, difficulties here. Robert, sometimes if yeah. you, this is this is Mike. Sometimes if you just stop the screen share and then start a new one and select the um, screen that you want to share, that works better. Okay, that's what I'm trying to find. Is that ah, stop the share? There we go. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. And now let's try this again in the presentation. Share. Okay. 
Okay, thank you everybody for bearing with me there. Uh, so just to give an overview of the CUDs of where they were at as of November, as I mentioned, there's at least one other town that has joined. There are currently nine communication union districts. This covers 157 towns that are members and another 55 are study areas. Well, what this means and to get just to get an idea of how many people, how many volunteers, I think that's one thing I wanna stress over and over again, are working on this issue that comes out to being 140, 157 board members and 157 alternates. These are the people that we've mobilized to work on broadband around the state. So I'm just gonna go through each CUD one by one. Uh, it's, I've, I've hoped many of you had had the chance to take a look at this when it was sent last month. So I don't wanna read every slide, but uh, Deerfield Valley, uh, Deerfield Valley down in Wyndham County, one of my favorite parts of the state. It was formed, almost all of these CUDs uh, were formed right after town meeting or at town meeting last year or during the pandemic. Since then, they've grown to now 20 towns since I mentioned Newfane joined, I believe it was last week, uh, covering parts of three different counties. So it's not just Wyndham anymore. Uh, they are one of the most advanced in terms of volunteers that are motivated, taking action and meeting I don't, the number of hours. We should put a dollar amount to the number of hours these groups are putting towards these projects. Uh, it's impressive. I end up talking to someone from this district probably three to four times a week at least. Uh, so the, I'm not gonna go over everything on here right now, but with the updates I can do is I know they're planning on issuing an RFP uh, they're looking and reviewing the results of the RDOF action, which I know Clay will talk about more. Uh, they're also dis in discussions with the next CUD, I believe on this thing, Southern Vermont CUD, about how to work together, whether that's a partnership or whether that's an eventual merger. Uh, I want to touch on that briefly. Of One thing that is at this point discouraging mergers is many of the programs that we've that have been were created in the beginning are a dollar amount per CUD. So that's something the CUDs have identified to look at um, going forward because there are economies of scale with larger districts. Uh, so Southern Vermont CUD, they also started a town meeting of uh, 13 towns, actually, I'm sorry, it's 14 towns. Londonderry joined them as well. A town can be a part of two, CU, two CUDs. Uh, which was a surprise to some towns and some <laughs> CUDs, but that's how it goes. Uh, they are moving along. They are looking for and needing what, what all the CUDs need as a project manager. These are volunteer groups. Uh, this CUD in, in particular, uh, they're struggling. They're struggling. A lot of the work is coming down to one volunteer, and they were also... I must say they are, they are a bit discouraged. They had, a few months ago they were they were hit with a records request, and I were all about public access and transparency. But when you're dealing with volunteers, that's a, it's enough to suck a lot of energy out of people, unfortunately. Uh, so that is another issue that the CUDs have raised with me is of how to make sure the public is in the know and how to also be able to compete in a competitive environment. So, and on each of these slides is also the link to the, the website. And most of these CUDs are working on uh, improving their websites now to, to integrate both information on various programs to increase connectivity, um, to just be more of a force in their community. Um, Otter Creek CUD, or, or Representative Sibley, do you have a question? Yes, I did really quickly. Can you just tell us the pink outline, what that means? Is that the so study area? That was the study area. On the new map, we've associated a study area with the respective CUD. That's why we, that's why we made that change. But for this, for this presentation, it was based on the old map. So Great. Um, so those are towns that, that may end up joining. Uh, and this is in the case of this one, it's um, Otter Creek CUD. It's uh, mostly Rutland County. And you can see some of the towns in the south are already built out by fiber. Uh, from VTEL. Um, so they are currently not, not part of the study areas. So we expect this CUD to, to grow a bit more. Uh, we also expect them to continue to working closely with the Addison County CUD, which is also known as Maple Fiber. 
Uh, one other thing I didn't, I didn't touch on is in each of these districts, we are working with the districts to install additional Wi-Fi hotspots uh, to the point of where we're covering almost every single town. I was hoping to share a map. I will send that later, but the, we are going so fast with installing. The minute I, we create a map, it's outdated. Uh, we will have uh, 190 sites statewide by the time this is, this is over. Uh, off the top of my head, it's about 45 in the kingdom. I think 19 in Deerfield Valley. It's, they're spread evenly around the state, but with a focus in areas with lower levels of connectivity. So Addison County, also known as Maple Fiber, was their, their new name, which is great. Uh, they, like all the other CUDs, are working through their feasibility studies and about to move into the business planning status. Uh, right now it's 16 towns and other towns are considering joining. Great. Uh, Northwest CUD. Uh, this is another CUD that has a great number of volunteers that are participating. It's one of the newer CUDs. Uh, mostly Franklin County. Uh, they're also maybe moving into the Grand Isle County with, with the islands. Uh, most of the islands are built out pretty well with cable though. Um, and this CUD is starting to work very closely with Lamoille and the Kingdom CUD. So they're, in the end, there may end up being one communication union district across the, the northern border. So Lamoille FiberNet. Um, Lamoille FiberNet, and this, is, this goes to most of the CUDs, the CUDs that are working closely with their regional planning commissions that are, getting that are getting administrative support or project management support are the ones that are moving along the quickest out of the new ones. Uh, and I, that's one thing I want to highlight uh, going forward. And that type of cooperation and collaboration is something that I'm working hard to promote. Uh, so Lamoille FiberNet is one of our smaller CUDs at this point. Uh, consists of most of Lamoille County. There are a few other towns that are that are considering or voting soon of whether to join or whether to go at their own. Like many of the CUDs, they're discussing which model makes sense, whether it's a working with a utility, whether it's a pu public-private partnership. Great. And then the Kingdom, our largest CUD, uh, will continue to grow. Uh, they are moving along. One of the highlights of uh, the project that they have underway is they're working with Kingdom Fiber right now to, the goal is to connect 100 underserved addresses in Albany with, uh, with Kingdom, with Fiber, to so the home uh, in several towns in Albany, Crassbury, Greensboro, and Hardwick. I believe 35 have been connected so far. Uh, we'll see if they reach 100 by the end. Uh, it's as everybody, everybody's up against a big deadline right now. I don't have to remind any of you that. The challenges that go with that. And they're operating in a, it's a, it's a hybrid public-private operator. Many of the CUDs are looking at, looking at they, they may not duplicate what EC Fiber is doing, where they both own the infrastructure and, op and operate it. Uh, in the case of the Kingdom, they're looking at possibly having multiple operators, but working to try to own the infrastructure. Uh, these are all questions that each of these CUDs are looking at. It's been quite the learning process. Uh, it's important to remember that the majority of these CUDs only really got started this summer. Right. And I am beyond impressed by the number of volunteer hours that are put in and the progress that they've made. It's never enough, of course. There's still plenty of people that don't have access to broadband, but they are making progress and putting posi positioning themselves to, to be major players going forward. Uh, CV Fiber is about to issue an RFP. Uh, they are working to submit a, a loan application to Vita and are looking to build. Uh, like several other CDs, they had big plans for what they hope to be able to accomplish by the end of the year. They are moving it forward. They have a project manager. I believe they're going to be looking for a new project manager. And that's that just to identify another challenge, uh, it's one of the challenges is, so some of this CARES Act money was able to provide that administrative and project management support, and that runs out the end of the year. So fi fi figuring out how to fill that gap is something that I've been spending a lot of time on. Uh, we've been partnering very closely with the Community Foundation to direct some funds to us assist with that, but it's, it's never enough. I can go over a little bit about some of the other funds we've leveraged at the, at the end of this. So EC Fiber, they admitted eight new towns. Uh, they hope to be building out some of them this year. 
Uh, you all are very familiar with uh, EC Fiber. They also are just selling additional, I think it's uh, 12 million uh, in the municipal bonds. They were said they were going to be closing in early December. I don't know if that's happened, uh, but they continue to steam ahead with serving additional people. So I know that was a, a quick overview of a lot of information on that slide. Um, so I welcome questions and can go from there. I'm going to stop the share. That was great, uh, Rob, and exactly what I was looking for in terms of giving us just a high level of where uh, where the CUDs are. Uh, and two takeaways uh, I heard you talk about were um, the need for project management. Well, the first thing I heard you talk about were the hundreds of volunteers that we have um, standing these uh, answering this call and uh, that they need project management support and uh, that they're having some public records request um, challenges that probably relates to the project management support. As well as uh, committee, do we have questions? Senator. Will the uh, department be offering any recommendations to us about needs to change, amend, or expand the legislation that we have for CUDs? Thank you, Senator. That's a very good question. Uh, I think the, the answer is yes, but the question is timing. We are very much focused right now on CRF and uh, um, emergency response recovery. So we've only had limited ability to convene internally to discuss the kinds of changes that are needed. Um, I'm hoping that we can have a collaborative uh, interaction with the jurisdictional committees on this as the session gets going, but I am not where I'd like to be on that right now. Meaning I'm not where I'd like to be with our own uh, affirmative recommendations. And the CUDs are all meeting. They've created an organization called uh, VACUDA uh, that is meeting and has a policy committee that's looking at a lot of these issues. Uh, one other thing that, that's happening that's being created with, with the support of the Vermont Community Foundation is what we're calling a CUD Broadband Accelerator Program that's going to be housed at Due North that's going to address just bringing people up to speed. When you have, I think we said it was 157 volunteers that are members of these boards. These are people that have a lot to learn in order to be able to actively participate. I know just since I've started last year, the number of different terms I've learned. Um, so we're creating this program that's gonna be, I think it's gonna be a, a six week program where they could help them get up to speed on the various issues, the various terminology, the various techno technologies. So that's one other way of techno uh, technical support that's being developed. There's also gonna be a track for the executive committees of the various uh, communication union districts to facilitate additional sharing of lessons learned, ideas and strategies, and to keep facilitating more collaboration on things because there's new ideas out there. There's always going to be new ideas, but there's also low, always lessons to be learned and we don't re need to recreate the wheel every time, even if the model is shifting a little bit with the times. One of the issues that you cited has been the problem of these open records requests uh, and the fact that they have been very difficult for these volunteer groups to do. Uh, have you provided, this is a multi-part question, have you provided uh, any guidance, particularly standardized guidance uh, to the CUDs uh, about how to do this? And so secondly, <clears throat> when these groups now create yet another group, which is kind of an umbrella organization for the CUDs. Have you provided any clarity as to how and to what extent those that entity is also subject to the Open Records Act? Have you sought any legal advice that might uh, help clarify that? So I'm, I'm gonna take those questions, Senator. Forgive me, I've got a frog in my throat. <clears> throat> um, you're, you're highlighting a very um, difficult issue because the department providing legal advice is fraught with problems. So we have provided as much guidance as can be provided without tripping over that line. 
And I cannot recommend that the department be doing that. So some of the CUDs, if I'm not mistaken, Rob, have used some of their CRF money to retain legal counsel and to get advice on Public Records Act issues. The other thing that's, that's very touch, mm -hmm. thank you. The other thing that's very touchy about this subject is that you're, you're talking about something that goes to the core of transparency. And so mm -hmm. the department would not, my, my department at least is not gonna be making an argument for less transparency. Um, but there is a real friction here, especially given the volunteer nature of the people who are doing this work uh, in deciding how much of, of their time can we realistically um, accept will be spent on doing the work of the CUDs and then tending to the responsibilities of a governmental subunit when they're not even governmental employees. So these are things that need to be thought through. And I think the best thing to do would be to hear directly from the CUDs on that. But from the department's end, we're in a very, um, I, I think, untenable position if the expectation is that the department would provide the kind of legal counsel or clarity that you've highlighted and that I agree is needed. Uh, very much. The other issue too is on this point, it's not just about logistics and resources, it's also about uh, parity in a market. So there's a, there's a market dynamic that needs to be considered. If we're expecting the CUDs to participate in what is in the end a competitive market, then having them subject to a degree of uh, disclosure about their business plans and the like that their competitors are not is in my opinion problematic and something that needs to be addressed. Does that answer your question? It does, and it also uh, kind of begs the question about, uh, is there anything that needs to be done legislatively? Uh, it, it, it certainly, as, as I said, we aren't where we would like to be. I, I have to say the strain on the department is enormous at this point, and it's not just the telecommunications work that we're happy to, and pleased to be doing, very proud to have done. It's, we're just, you know, we're dealing with the emergency and it's not sustainable in the end. Um, I mean, for a longer period of time. And as a result, our core missions are suffering at this point, I have to frankly say. And you've, and this is, there's, there are a few issues I care more about than things like public records. I think what's happening in our country shows that, um, you know, much of what we have in public records today is a function of the Watergate era and what's happening now nationally in our federal government is showing that the, a lot of those reforms have limitations and we're learning lessons there that are gonna to need to be applied in due course. And you know, where we're gonna find the time to digest all of this, I don't know. Uh, okay. Senator Let's, Kitchen, uh, I think had her hand yeah, up. She does. I do, I do. Um, um, obviously the uh, uh, staff, uh, time and burden uh, to undertake um, multiple FOIA requests is proving to be very substantial. Um, and Commissioner Tierney, is there a provision under existing statute where um, in fact, um, after X amount of time or requests that, um, that there is a provision to um, uh, bill uh, for the um, time involved? I think that there, this is an area that needs further review, Senator, because my memory of the statute as drawn is that yes, there are provisions that, um, that require or that, that allow for billing. <clears throat> the difficulty that we're struggling with now is there's been subsequent litigation and a decision from the Vermont Supreme Court and the administration has construed that decision in a manner that um, on the safe side, counseling side, um, instructs the, I hope I'm using that word right, the agencies to not charge for their time. I see. Or at least okay. not in, in ways that are, that are for activities that are core to how we are dealing with records requests now that the records are available electronically. And I, I just want to emphasize for the record that the department has met every request that has been um, sent to it. And we, we, we have not complained about the burden at all because it's not, it's not good form and it's not proper for government to complain. Um, the CUDs, it's a little different. These are volunteer citizens 
And I, I think if you asked any one of those people who are volunteering, they would be the first to say they want government transparency. So this isn't about feeling like someone's put upon for having to do this good transparency work. It's that our expectations and our resources don't match the ideals in the statute. I see. I, I just wanted to, um, someone mentioned that and I just wanted to clarify because I think perhaps this, um, um, uh, the burden on CUDs, particularly considering <laughs> how thin the staffing is and um, dealing with volunteers um, uh, poses a, a significant um, um, demand. So um, I guess what you're saying is, yes, we've got some language, but in response to Senator Brock's question, maybe it's something that um, in light of that court decision um, needs to um, needs to be uh, looked at um, legislatively in terms of what's in the statute. I, I, yes, I, do. I think, and it's very important to be clear about the different issues here that are intersecting. One is clarifying the statute in light of recent case law. The second is re-examining the statute in light of what state government's capabilities actually are as opposed to the expectations and making greater harmony there. But the third is the what I would think of as unique position of the CUDs. I think of mm -hmm. them as more quasi-governmental. And in that arena, to the extent that they're governmental, yes, there are public records request issues that perhaps need to be revisited for them. But on the other side of that, the part that's quasi where they're competitors in a market, that's where I think if there was ever a case for some form of carve out treatment, it's in, in that uh, regard, because you, it's just not fair to expect them to compete with a hand tied behind their backs. So yeah. happy to revisit that more perhaps in GovOps or whatever the, the committee is. But um, yes, I think that would be a productive area for legislative attention. I think Thank it's uh, good information for this committee and the committee's jurisdiction to have not only um, the time that this is taking for the CUDs, but also the volume of requests that I'm aware of that are coming into the department, uh, just understanding that um, and what it takes to, um, to respond to that, I think is important when we think about all of the work uh, that needs to happen at the department and just making sure we're, we're aware of that. Uh, does the committee have any additional questions on CUDs? I think I'd like to. Move I do on. have one more thing. I do have one yeah. more thing I just want to touch on, and that is the Vita Broadband Loan Expansion Program. Um, many of the CUDs are looking at that right now, and I believe there's less than ten million dollars left in that. Uh, there's also the issue of uh, it's the, the way the legislation says is that Vita can fund up to ninety percent of the loan. Uh, that was interpreted by a lot of the CUDs as meaning that only they had to come up with a 10% contribution. From our talk with uh, talks with Vita, that's not the case. It's at least a 10% contribution, and not having a set number is causing challenging issues. It's just uh, planning issues. So, Rob, uh, I have a question for you on this. Have have we had a Vita loan that's been made? We have, we have not had a beta loan that's been made okay. to a CUD. It looks like CV Fiber will ideally be the first. The ones that have oh. been made so far are to, uh, are, are to, private, private for, to a private entity. And it's um, one, correct? I, I think that entity has had several loans now, um, but it's just a single entity, yes. Single entity. Right. Um, I, this is um, Jane. Um, yeah. I, I need to... <sighs> Gee, my memory is like a junkyard. Um, but we did appropriate money to be yes. the match for the CUDs. And I, I don't, I think it might have been general fund, um, which um, allows us, you know, we're not working against that December uh, deadline. So I just wanted to remind people that um, there, the legislature did respond to that, uh, to that need, match need. Um, to help with the development of the CUDs. And so at this point, there's been one then um, mm -hmm. match. Okay. And everyone's very excited about that. And no, that there has not been one match yet because uh, no CUDs have applied just to, just oh. to clarify there. Uh, but oh, they're, okay. they're excited and we're excited to roll out that, roll out that program. All right, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Okay, uh, we're gonna move on into the monthly report. 
um, commissioners at play? It, it, it will be. I just want to point out that we provided you with a document this morning that, that Clay is going to be briefing you off of. Those uh, numbers are the most recent numbers as compared to the ones in the report that are now out of date. So, uh, Clay, go ahead. Uh, I, okay. I, I'm no, sorry. No, is this, did, was I not clear? I'm sorry. Uh, well, no, I just want to make sure I printed out the November 30th report. Yes. There's a document that we gave Mike this morning. It's a it's a yeah. table of figures, basically. Jim, I, I plan to share my screen. So okay, go ahead. So we'll, you'll them. you'll see Thank the you. information I'm talking about. Great. Thank you. Go ahead, Clay. Good morning. My name is Clay Purvis, I'm director for telecommunications with the Department of Public Service. In a moment, I'm going to share my screen. Is this showing up? There are three showing up, Clay, and Thank it's you. the central one. There you go. I'm sorry, there are three. Sure. Okay. It's there now. Uh, all right, great. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so I was asked to prepare uh, information on CRF expenditures. Um, we filed a report uh, for the, no the November uh, COVID response connectivity report um, talking about our expenditures to date. Um, this chart here that I have, um, we've put together to show what our expected expenditures will be at the end of the year. And uh, most of them align with the chart or with the uh, report we filed in November or for November, excuse me. Um, the one variation uh, that I want to discuss at the outset is that in the uh, November report, uh, we did not subtract the amount that was uh, reallocated for the uh, water, wastewater program. So that is not present in our report, but it's present here. Um, so these numbers should be correct. And as far as the spending authority column and the spending allocation column goes, should align with what reports the administration is filing with uh, the Joint Fiscal Committee. So for connectivity, um, at the outset, uh, we allocated uh, 12 million. We've, we've obligated, as in we have contracts for 11,974,000. For line extensions, um, that was capped at 2 million. We put the 2 million toward line extensions. We've only had um, 550,000 obligated. These are line extensions that could be done by the end of the year. Um, so that leaves a rather large balance at the end of the year. The cause of this is largely due to the uh, constraints on the December that are placed on carriers by the December 30 deadline. So uh, Clay, many, excuse may me. May I ask a question on that? Uh, yeah. If I'm, I've seen a, a document that talks about what would appear to be the possibility of extending the amount of time to do installations because of things like supply chain disruptions. Yes. We talked, for example, previously about long lead times to get fiber in. Uh, and as a result, uh, that backed up our timeline. But I gather there's some, the, some treasury guidance out that provides some exceptions. Uh, could you address that? Yes, I can. Um, the, uh, there is treasury guidance. Um, the state's consultant has a memo out on, um, and I can send you a link to that memo. Um, on line on extensions of time, it is possible to um, I have a copy of that memo. It's just called Supply Chain Disruption Guidance and Analysis. Correct. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, I think the the major difference when we will probably avail ourselves of that for some line extensions that we funded, as well as connectivity initiative projects, because we are experiencing delays. Um, due to things like supply chain issues, make ready has been a, um, a significant issue. 
Um, not to put any pole owning utility down, uh, every pole owning utility that we've dealt with has, um, has uh, gone above and beyond um, what they were required to do under the pole make ready rules, including consolidated and, um, and GMP. GMP has really done a lot of uh, extra work to get poles prepared. But um, in, in, in many instances, I think we're going to see um, the need to, uh, to provide extensions of time for both line extensions and connectivity initiative projects. I think the fundamental difference here with a lot of these projects is from the outset, carriers told us, no, we can't get this completed by December 30th. And I think it would be disingenuous of us to um, attempt to start a project knowing at the outset that the carriers just don't have the resources um, such as staffing to complete uh, line extensions before December 30th. Well, the thing that I was thinking about in particular was uh, further expansion of fixed wireless. And I know that there were a number of proposals, some of which the department accepted. Uh, there are others that are, are still on the shelf. Uh, if the equipment were in fact available, uh, I would think that some of those could be finished by the end of the year but they're not available and would that fall within the, uh, the guidance of this particular item to allow uh, that to be accepted now, but subject to the equipment being delivered later and therefore qualify for that exemption? That's a, a possibility. I'd have to review the guidance a little more closely on that particular hypothetical. Um, and give you an answer but later. If that's true, it would seem to suggest, since the department has already accepted uh, several projects along those lines, that that might be one way to expand broadband uh, fairly substantially within the confines of this $3.8 million that's unspent. So I, I, along those lines, uh, I think before we are looking, um, I, I'd like to understand about the current obligations um, for wireless uh, that have been made um, before we're talking about expanding that. Um, I, I have some pretty um, significant questions in that regard. Um, we had asked in October um, how uh, those wireless addresses and particularly um, uh, awards that were made to uh, folks who don't have uh, the best track record in delivering what they um, have said, how those would be certified, how we would know that uh, they were in fact providing 25.3. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm wondering if we can uh, get an answer to that question to several questions I have in that regard. Uh, the first one being, have all the wireless addresses uh, that have been paid, paid, not obligated, um, been certified for 25-3? And if so, uh, can you tell us about the certification process? So if I, if I may for a moment jump in here, uh, Senator Brock was asking a question about the use of the CARES Act money and um, I'd like to just tie that up and then go to your Q&A, Representative Sibilia, about these uh, verification issues. Well, I think Senator Brock is asking about using these funds to expand right. fixed wireless. And, and, I, and I just, for, I just yeah. yeah, and I just want to make sure the record is clear about what it is we're talking about, mm -hmm. because the document that's up right now reflects the amount of money that we have obligated squarely within the existing treasury guidance so that if there's an auditor, these are things that we have a high degree of confidence right. are going to pass muster. This variance that's left over the 1.4 million to which Senator Brock is pointing along with the other remaining funds in the balance, what I hear you to be saying is couldn't we be accepting more projects uh, because there is this treasury guidance out there that says that under certain circumstances, if it's an equipment delay or the like, that's a CARES um, Act eligible activity, notwithstanding that it wouldn't necessarily be tied up before December 30th. 
And the way I would answer that is, in the first instance, we've, we've hewed very closely to the Treasury guidance as it existed when we first started approving projects under this program. And as Clay was saying, the, the standard at that time for us was, if we don't think there's a good faith chance that this is going to get done by that December 30 timeframe, then it's irresponsible to have the project um, launch. That said, Clay, if, if I remember correctly, we have kept track of folks who have contacted us and who've wanted line extensions, whose projects we could not necessarily um, in good faith go forward with in the hopes that if the timeline were to be extended or if um, the consultants were to be um, more forgiving, if you will, in the guidance they give along the lines of what you're talking about, Senator Brock, that those could be then funded. And then thirdly, in the uh, emergency telecom plan draft that we're reviewing right now, th those folks have made a case that this program should continue and because it's a, a useful tool in the toolbox subject to the concerns that Representative Sibilia is now articulating. Um, but, but they've made that case and there is some chatter coming out of DC that the deadline, the December 30 deadline will be extended. Uh, of course, it, there'll be a question of whether this legislature choose, chooses to leave this funding in place or sweep it to use it for something else. But assuming that the deadline were extended or at a minimum that Guidehouse were to opine that we in fact could procure equipment knowing that it isn't gonna get here and isn't gonna be deployed until after December 30, it is possible that we could do more extensions under this program, but that is not where the department is right now. And we would want something more directive from the legislature, I think, before we went down that path. Um, now to Representative Sibelius' questions, uh, do you want us to tie off the CRF expenditure discussion or do you want to go into the verification process now? Uh, I'd like to go into the verification process now because of the time that we have left. And I have, uh, I think it's really pertinent uh, in terms of thinking about how any remaining funds may be spent. And so I have a number of questions, particularly about the certification process and the ability to claw back on particularly wireless and fixed wireless uh, awards that have been made. And so, so we are, as we speak, we are in the process of uh, getting these grants performed. So the first, the first focus has been getting the grants signed, the contractors getting to work on deploying to the addresses that are specified in their grant agreements and for which they have assumed a legal obligation to verify that the speed that they have told us in the grant uh, process that they are going to be delivering to those addresses, in fact, is being delivered or deliverable. That's, that's a 25-3 speed, correct? That's the 25-3 or better speed. That's correct. So they, they have assumed that obligation in the grant agreement. We have not yet closed out any grants agreements, to my knowledge, uh, Clay, and I don't think we expect to um, before December 30. You'll have to correct me if I'm wrong on that, Clay. We may, we may close out a few. I'm not few. sure that we'll have wireless yeah. ones closed out. We, Our we have not are wrapping up now. Right. We, we have not dispersed any funds either, except to the extent that we have uh, done pre-approved payment agreements for uh, the smaller providers who simply can't afford to do this on credit, all of which we've documented. Um, so at this time, Ms. we Sharon, have not paid you... anything. I'm sorry. Tell me what closed. Can you please explain what closed out means? Clay, will you speak to that, please? Technically, yeah. sure. After the project is completed, you know what, what we get from grantees is a report uh, describing uh, the project that was completed um, with the information we've asked, including certification that the addresses um, included in the grant agreement do in fact have service. So we, we've per, each grant agreement has the list of addresses down to the 911 east side ID um, that they're required to build service to. For wireless carriers, they do have to perform a speed test 
and uh, provide us with that information in addition to the certification that they have in fact served those addresses. They have to do a speed test where? At the address or is that? Uh... At, the, at the address, yes. Okay, and so then every uh, wireless address that uh, you will pay for when you close out that grant is when you will pay for it and that will have a certified speed test for the address done by the provider. Correct. That's and correct. And so my, uh, my next question on that is what if- Well, there's, uh, there's comes... one, one detail before you go to your next question, which is that there's a provision in the grant agreement mm -hmm. that expressly states that if they fail to certify less than 85% of the addresses in their grant, they're subject to forfeiture of their entire grant. Okay. So to be clear with you, there, well, there is a, a margin in there of addresses where they may not be able to certify. And the check on that is if that margin gets beyond 15%, they lose their entire grant. For the addresses that they are not able to certify, they get a pro rata reduction of their grant. Okay, is it, uh, I mean, is it, uh, you know, 5% is 5% off? I mean, it's, no, it's up to 15%. At 15%, if, if you fail to, to certify 15% yeah. of the addresses that you said you were going to provide service at, you, you, you lose your entire grant. And so if you fail to uh, provide at 5%, is do you forfeit 5%? I'm, correct. I'm you, you, well, you, you, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you forfeit a pro rata share. That's correct. And is there any provision, Commissioner, um, you know, in, in March... Uh, say these have been paid for, certified paid for, mm -hmm. and we have, um, they, they don't actually, the folks don't actually have to be taking service, correct? So correct. if we have folks that go to take service and it uh, is found that in fact a certified address is not providing service, uh, mm -hmm. do we have any? Um... The, yes. The, the service obligation is for five years. So once okay. the, the once the project is complete, they have to provide service to those locations in accordance okay. with the grant agreement for five years. Okay. And that, that five year period is important because that provides the framework for what I think of as the, the independent check by the department. So we don't just rely on the representation in the certification, although I wanna emphasize that, that certification has a very precise legal significance. Uh, it, it comes with what's you know, called a heightened indicia of reliability, and it forms the basis of an enforcement action if they're found to be in breach of their agreements. As in, you certified that you were doing this, and now you're telling us you haven't, that's actionable as a breach. But that said, what we plan to do is to put out a mailer to all of the listed addresses, announcing to them that this service has been procured and deployed, it's available to you to, to take. And if you have any difficulties taking the service, or if the service is not at the speed that was represented, please contact the Department of Public Service. So that's the that's the first, you know, you know, and I think the most important check on that. I will I will tell you frankly that what happens next depends on judgment about what the feedback means. If we hear from two or three people about problems and we contact the carrier and are able to resolve two or three problems, uh, that's indicative of a system that's working, meaning a regulatory check. And I think um, you know we can be we can we can applaud that. If we are getting back a response level that indicates that there's a bigger problem, you know, if we start hearing from tens and twenties and thirties of people who are having difficulty getting the thing that's supposed to be available to them, that becomes um, the basis of an enforcement action that's more legal in nature, as in going to court suing for breach of agreement. So there's a, a degree of judgment that will have to be exercised about what to do in, in the face of the numbers that we're getting uh, by way of feedback. And that's very much um, the way that we approach other types of enforcement actions like, uh, like this for other utility services. 
Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this, as you know, is uh, an area of significant concern for me, and um, I'm satisfied today um, with that your department um, is um, really managing um, for uh, legitimate concerns. So thank you for the explanation. Um, we are getting close on time. Um, I would like to give Clay a moment to go through the rest of this. Um, do you mean the numbers on the screen? Yes. Yeah. Oh, very good, because I just want to draw the committee's attention in case we run out of time to the fact that we've also provided you with a new coverage map that shows the outcome of the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund auction that the FCC just concluded. That may be of interest to you. But it wasn't on your agenda for today, so we'll, but it's there for you to look at. And if you have any questions, please let us know. We're happy to answer them. Go ahead, Clay. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, so, so as I was saying, the line extension um, is, is uh, kind of under budget, but uh, to the extent there is an extension of time or we are able to do line extensions in 2021, um, I, I do believe the capacity is there. Um, we have a lot of applications that are simply on hold because we've been told that by the carrier that they just can't simply get to these by December 30th. Um, and if there is an extension, we would expect to complete those and significantly increase that number. And broadband subsidy, um, again, we have an issue of a low take rate. Um, take rate has increased significantly in the past uh, two weeks. Um, I think as a result of uh, some advertising efforts that the department undertook in November um, so we, we still have 1,200 applications that are pending that uh, carriers are working through. Um, so this, this program we budgeted um, 3 million, a little over 3 million for, um, that's now down to uh, 2 million 658. But um, again, if an extension were to occur, um, I, I think this would be, um, a valuable program to continue through the school year. Uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, Rob could speak to that. I, we're gonna blow the budget on that. Everybody wants a hotspot um, that's been uh, very successful and um, uh, from the standpoint of deployment and um, popular with the towns and the communities that um, are receiving them. Um, if you have questions about CUD infrastructure and planning, I would defer to Rob. Um, these are the, the 2.3 million that was allocated to, uh, to CUDs to do planning. Uh, a lot of the same problems uh, with the other infrastructure projects, just getting projects done by December 30th um, has proven very problematic, um, but CUDs have come up with some creative ways to, to do something valuable in their communities. Um, the COVID-19 telecom plan, uh, we budgeted 500, we're spending 475. Um, PEG TV funding, we're gonna draw that down to zero. But if we could just go back to the emergency telecom plan, we've also provided you with a slide deck that the consultants have been using to brief folks in public hearings around the state about the preliminary findings. We expect the uh, final report December 20. And at that time, we're happy to schedule a legislative briefing of uh, any description that you folks feel would be useful for your colleagues to ask um, your former colleague, Mr. Dunn, to walk through that report uh, for you. Um, I, uh, as usual, we uh, have gotten, we are, um, we are at time. Um, we have not gotten uh, to the emergency plan and we may not have gotten to, um, I have, but I want to be sensitive of uh, my colleagues and your, uh, your staff's time, Commissioner. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, last questions or uh, important issues uh, that you think should not wait, um, Commissioner or committee? Well, at what point will we be, uh, as a committee, 
uh, be able to hear about the, uh, the, the broadband plan. And uh, again, the planning, which is also on our agenda, re the 10 year telecommunications plan. Those I think are critical issues uh, that should not wait until we're back in January. So we have a letter from the commissioner and uh, that is posted on our site about the, re the uh, regular 10 year telecom plan. Uh, Commissioner or uh, Senator, did you want to try and schedule uh, a hearing before uh, in between December 20th and January 6th so that we can hear the well I think, uh, I think that's are important issues going going out the gate that we we need to, to to deal with early in the legislative session but I'll be mindful of what other members of the committee uh, think at this point. I certainly would agree with you. I think that we had some encouragement not to add, not to add additional meetings at this point, and so you know we're just running into the you know we're running into the holiday uh, we're in the holiday period and uh, looking at uh, the legislative session starting, and of course then we have the committees of jurisdiction um, coming into play, who of course will want to um, be hearing about this. Uh, you know maybe. Senator, this is something that you and I can speak with the commissioner about offline and maybe uh, the chairs of the two um, uh, committees of jurisdiction, maybe we can uh, hold a joint hearing on that telecom plan uh, either early in the session uh, with our committee. I don't know if you have any other suggestions for today on-, on um, Well, again, we don't have to proceed. Today, so, uh take it offline and, uh, and, and discuss the best way forward. I would agree there are a lot, there's a lot to discuss and learn and hear about um, and limited time. So uh, we did receive uh, a number of documents. Uh, before we conclude the meeting, Clay, why don't you, um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, just tell us about the documents or commissioner, whomever is best suited sure. to tell us about the documents that have been posted to our site. I can do that. So there's this document, um, Rob's material that he went over is also posted. Um, I've posted as well the, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund map, um, and I'm happy to discuss that map with members offline, uh, but that shows the census blocks that have been funded um, through phase one of the RDOF auction. Um, you can see it hits many areas of the state. And so that that's broadband that'll be built in state over the next six years. Um, I believe that's it for material. Unless I'm missing one. Mike, you might want to chime in if I've forgotten something. Okay. Okay. Uh, so with that, I think, um, uh, we will adjourn. I want to thank everyone for their time today. Commissioner, um, uh, as always, um, we've run out of time and you're, we have uh, a lot that we want to discuss with you. So we will be in touch to talk um, outside uh, of this committee and um, look forward to working with you in the upcoming legislative session. If it helps too, um, I'm happy to offer that we come in as early as possible in the legislative session to brief you on what will then be the final emergency broadband action plan. And um, happy to brief you on the RFP that we've put out for the 10 year plan, if that helps. I just know that between now and the end of the year, things get awfully uh, crowded for everybody. And I can understand yeah. Senator Brock's concern about wanting to take these very important matters up. I think what we're starting to feel, frankly, is the um, the lag is now caught up to us of things that are getting deferred because we're dealing with the emergency. But um, however, Let we can me, help get you is there a, uh, available a copy of the RFP that we can look well, at. I'm glad to get yeah, you that. We can, yes. send, we can send you that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me just for the purposes just just to do it. Uh, does Do folks on the committee feel like we could meet again uh, prior to the session? I think it's really tough. And um, so I, I, I guess the question is, 
is there something there that is so time sensitive that action needs to be taken uh, to warrant another meeting uh, versus um, a briefing that maybe we could get through other material. So I, I, um, I, am, I, I am feeling just really hammered with um, meetings between now and Christmas, to be honest. I, 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 my sense was that was the case. Um, I think, Commissioner, if you find that your uh, department is in a position where you're looking to reallocate um, uh, those funds, I think we would be quite interested in weighing in on that. Um, so, yeah, well, this, it, it gets tricky because uh, this is the with the Joint Fiscal Committee process, and of course, Senator Kitchell is very familiar right. with that too. Um, but, you know, in answer to your question, is there anything time sensitive? If there is, that would be it. Right. That we're trying to, to move some money around in ways that are, is materially different from what's authorized right now in statute. Um, but in terms of, of the planning um, that Senator Brock is interested in, um, I don't think it's time sensitive um, un unless in reviewing the RFP, um, you see an issue there and Anyway, I, I to do, be, to I be do perfectly, have, our focus right now is on emergency response. Yeah, That's, I, I do have one know. comment and I, uh, I'm trying to find the document because in fact, at our this joint fiscal committee yes. meeting we had, um, there, the administration was proposing different uses of these funds. And I suspect, and some of it was over 4 million from um, that we had allocated to education um, yes. And we raised the concern about um, how, um, how, and we're proposing alternative uses. And so I, uh, I want to check that list because I do believe that there is the potential that money that was originally allocated to um, Commissioner Tierney's department has, uh, is being proposed for reallocation, which raises a serious concern if there is in fact an avenue to preserve that CRF funding for the purposes that uh, were originally intended as Senator Brock has identified an avenue to do that. So, so Senator, I'll, I'll have to look into that. I can tell you that as far as my desk is concerned and my pen is concerned, uh, I have not proposed any reallocations of my department's funding to the administration so I'll, I'll chase that down. Somebody else, may, if, if that yeah. has happened, somebody I, I else I will chase it. it down because we yeah. received um, a, a, a chart from okay. the administration that indicated where they were going to find the money to okay. support the proposals that okay. they advanced to joint fiscal committee meeting two Understood. days ago. That's the document that will tell us whether uh, the money has been scooped, identified to be scooped. And um, the at that point, the committee uh, was reluctant to move forward um, because of where some of the sources were um, that were identified. And so we um, did only a, a minimal approval yeah. of two requests. Uh, one was very straightforward to the National Guard for setting up the surge hospital. And the other was to make sure we had adequate funding for the hazard pay benefit program uh, for those frontline employees working um, in retail, et cetera. So um, okay. I, will, I will look at the chart and I will send it out to um, uh, the chair and co-chair and then you can distribute it from there. And Senator, if it's possible, if you could let me know if you find out anything because I, I'm trying to give you comfort <laughs> that as far as I know, my monies have not been touched. Okay. Um, I obviously, I, I don't control what the administration at levels above me chooses to do, but my experience has been that they, they have not yet taken money from me without talking to me and I don't believe they have taken okay, money. Okay, well, I'll help I'll that's you. the case. Yeah, I, and I've, walked, I've, I've tried to walk that line with how do we, where I felt responsibility is getting money back to you folks if you've wanted it for something else. Senator and if Kitchell, anything that I've held on to it too long. Was that um, the December seventh meeting? Yes. Yeah. I've, I'm looking at the chart, and we don't have um, DPS on there that I okay. see. 
because I, I stayed out of that one because I, I was involved, if you recall, in the November one, but I, I didn't put anything forward in December because I was thinking, you know, let's see how far we can get with our money before we turn it over to you okay. folks to put the well, unemployment. Well, um, Representative um, Sebelia has answered the question. Okay. Uh, none of, none of the, um, that chart did not include any reallocation from your department. But so. this is a very helpful exchange because as you saw from the chart we presented today, if we do have that $3 million overage, my my thought is, and this is really what Jai Talk can help me with, my, my thought is that we should try to hold on to that money um, in case there is an extension of the, the timeline and use it for the purposes that it was appropriated for. But there is tension there because I'm aware that money's needed in the unemployment insurance fund and the like. So if you have guidance to give me on that, I'm I'm all ears. But um, we've we've it's been weighing on us heavily that we do have this three million here that we're having trouble with. So Commissioner, so, I'm going to ask that um, if we get to a reallocation spot for you, uh, that you reach out to will, Senator Brock and I, and that we okay. see if there is. Uh, at least if there's a way for us to meet uh, briefly to talk about that. It sounds like a plan. Happens before the year. Is that like a, a Senator Brock, does that work for you? Okay. Great. Great. Okay. okay. Uh, I want to thank everyone and I appreciate your patience. Um, I wish we had more time. I appreciate uh, everyone staying with us over time here um, and uh, wish you all a happy holidays. Thank you again, Commissioner and your staff. Uh, we know that you all are doing triple time. Um, thank days. you, so, and, and thank you for all of your input, legislators. You've been extremely helpful, and and I've personally enjoyed this uh, collaboration.